Great, thank you very much, Reverend Jeff. And I want to reiterate again and join with your opening remarks that you often remind people that our reason for our discussion of dialogue in the world is not cause any experience and any issues, but just to get at the truth and an understanding of the word that we correctly or correctly divide the truth which we are obligated to by the same word that we are studying to show ourselves approved of God work men and need if not be ashamed rightly dividing the word. It's very important that we rightly divide the word. Because if we don't rightly divide it, we can get a lot of confusion and we can open up ourselves to challenges from critics who very much want to discredit some of the essentials of our biblical understanding. And if you check carefully even in what we are doing in our study, you'll recognize that way back 2,000 years plus ago that the Jews and the Romans tried to discredit the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's, that's a plan of the devil. The devil would have been behind that because he, he knows essentially the power of Christ's death and resurrection, what it means to us as Christians, and Paul reiterated it. It's very significant. It's foundational to our belief system, and it's essential um, to, to Christianity. And so we saw that the scribes and the Pharisees tried to discredit the reality of what happened. And even the chief priests were trying to pay people to say that the disciples came and stole the body because they want to discredit the fact that Jesus, as he said, he would lay down his life and he would rise again after three days. So that has continued right down to our time that people have tried to discredit the authority of the world and the essential truths that we stand by. This is why we have carefully studied the word and defend it because there are critics still out there trying to discredit the accounts of the Gospels in relation to the death and crucifixion uh, and resurrection of Jesus. So they try to look at every little detail that they can get to try to indicate that there are discrepancies or that there is conflict in the world. We know that the word of God does not contradict itself. What happens are people's interpretations, and sometimes um, the way people see things is what often creates problems because we do not look at the word in depth that we should, and then it leads us to misinterpretation and misunderstandings. And so, my, my purpose is to try to help clarify some of those things that critics want to use to argue against the authority and the um, veracity of the word and give us the assurance that we can defend the word and we can stand by what has been revealed to us through the gospel of Thomas or through any other part of scripture. Before we get into our session tonight, we're going to be examining some of apparent um, discrepancies. I use the word apparent because it appears to some people that there are discrepancies because they might not have examined the word in, in the detail that they should and not compare the statements made by the writers, the different um, writers of the New Testament, of the Gospels in particular so that they would come up with what they would call discrepancies or contradictions. I just want to you know, summarize briefly what where we ended off because one of our, our, our per the persons involved in, in the study, I think it would, this, would have indicated that she still saw um, two anointings, as I was saying that there were three. And yes, there are some people that would conclude there are two anointings. Things. There are some that would say there's just one anointing. That's why we examine the word carefully to see what it was, what was being revealed to us. Now, I believe it is very clear to us that the Luke's account is, is, is completely different from 
the other three that we see in the Gospels, in the other Gospels. That is clear, and I try to point that out. It's a different location, and it's far removed in time. And I try to indicate that if we read the part of the chapter before and, and after, we got a clear indication as to where Jesus was and after he healed the um, widow of the son, we realized that Jesus went around the countryside um, teaching and, you know, and healing and delivering people from, from problems, which we said would not have been the case if that was dealing with the Passion Week. Because in the Passion Week, Jesus did not have time to move around um, a variety of areas, but just from Jerusalem to Bethany, back to Jerusalem, because he was focusing on the mission that was soon going to be completed. So that would have been giving us evidence that Luke's account is completely different. Now, now where the um, misunderstanding sometimes come is that all the other three, which are now connected to the Passion Week, would have been the same anointing. Okay, so that's why some people conclude that there were two. Luke, completely different, but all the others are the same. And I took time to, to show you the details of the accounts. And even though we get similar details, we, we must bear this in mind when we are studying the Gospels. As a matter of fact, not only in relation to the Gospels, but any reporting, you can have similar details of the same event. And you can have the same event with different details. And that is very, very possible in any form of report and talk. So what we would have seen in the gospel is that, yes, with one event, you can have similar details, but it's still the same event. Or we can have different details. Good night, everyone. Good night. But it's still the same event. And we must bear this in mind because that, that is very plausible. Because different reporters can focus on different elements of the same event. But when we get different times, that is very significant that we have to bear that in mind. We cannot get the same event different times because you can't get two things happening, the same event happening at different times. And that's why we have to conclude that in the other accounts, Mark and Matthew are relating the same event. That's the, the, the supper that took place two days before the Passover. But John is reporting, even though you've got similar details, he's reporting a supper that took place six days before the Passover. So legally speaking, on, on, on all fronts, it, it cannot be the same event. You cannot go in the court of law and argue that because it took place on two different days. Yes, there are similar events, similar details, I should say, similar details that are recorded, but there are still two different times. So we have to conclude that it cannot be the same event because it took place on two, two different times. So my conclusion is based on, on the details and the information is that we have three anointings, one in Luke, John and then Matthew and Mark give a similar time frame and similar details so they can conclude that they're speaking about the same event. Okay, it's the same time frame and the similar details. And while John has similar details, John's going to take place on a different occasion. So that is what I would be inclined to, to accept as what the word is teaching. So I hope. Any other person that might have a little doubt in your mind, of course, you know, you you might be free to, to have your opinions, but you know, examine them in the light of, of what the word is trying to indicate to us. So just you know to clarify those particular points. And of course, if other persons still have any doubts in their mind, you know, we can create a little time um, for dialogue. Then we come on to the end of the session and we still want to clarify any little points that we need to clarify.
We're going to use the same procedure as last week. I will try as much as possible to give you ample time to respond. That again, by a quarter to nine, I finish my last presentation and give opportunity for questions. And if you don't have any questions, we will still close off the session um, and try not to go past the time that we have allocated. All right. Now tonight, I said what we want to get into is look at, looking at apparent discrepancies or contradictions in the accounts, in the gospel accounts dealing with the crucifixion. In the next session, we will defer the ones relating to the resurrection. We will want to include both of them because there are some that would need um, a little more explanation. And I will introduce a particular one tonight that has been traditionally viewed in a, in a different regard. Just to throw that up there and give you some time to study it because it will take some time for us to analyze the full details. And, and this is related, related to how many persons were crucified with Jesus. You know, the traditional view is that there were two persons, one on either side. And is that what a complete analysis of the four accounts indicate to us? It's important that if you want to get a complete understanding of the narrative related to the crucifixion, to the resurrection, you have to study all four Gospels and see how they um, complement each other. And where there are differences, understand why we have differences in the account and see how they can be reconciled. Because they can be. If they cannot be reconciled, it means that there are contradictions or there are discrepancies. So they have to be accounts that can be reconciled. So back to the point I'm making, you're going to get different reporters describing the same event and giving different details, but it does not necessarily mean it's a discrepancy. It's just that it's a different detail or, or seen from a different perspective that's related to the same event. And that's what is important. And we can't just look at one gospel. Because what has happened is that we have read what one particular gospel has said, form a conclusion from that. We don't looking at comparatively, and remember we said, and that's one principles that we should apply when we're studying the word of God. Look for other references, compare them, and make sure we get the details accurately understood before we really form a conclusion or we can mislead ourselves. We can come up with the wrong interpretation. That's an interesting one because the tradition has been established, and you know very often that traditions are established but not necessarily based on what is accurate. We have seen that in, in our previous discussions and the studies that we've been doing so far, that, that sometimes traditions become like the reality or the truth because we, we've been with them so long and the foundation on which they have based, they may seem to be accurate and we do not check other sources and really thoroughly investigate them to see that there may be possibly error and we come along with the tradition. We see that even with the, what we would call the Christmas tradition that people put the wise men with the shepherds. And that was traditionally what was seen in, in movies and in books and in posters. And that's very often what happens. These things get into our psyche and it becomes like the reality. And then we, you know, would believe that there were only three wise men based on, again, what tradition would have established. And then tradition would have established the whole thing in relation to the birth of, of Christ. And, and these are things that we have come along with. And then sometimes what happens is that we try to defend them because they are traditions. So we have some in, connected, in connection with the crucifixion um, of Jesus and the resurrection. We have looked at some details already in relation, in relation to the timing of those events. But we also have some things that have been established by the tradition which have become part of of our understanding. So I want you to think that too and tell me if from your reading and your analysis, and remember you have to read all four of the accounts. And maybe when we finish the area that we are going to be looking at first tonight, and we can get a chance to, to hint at some of, of the information, it will, it will throw some little thoughts in your head to make you reflect on them. Were they two that were on the cross, Jesus, or were they 
four, two on either side, and not just one on either side. That is the tradition he taught that there were just two persons on the cross, one on either side. And remember, I want to put this in there for you again. Pay careful attention to what the Gospel of John says. Because remember, I indicated from the very beginning, the Gospel will come for it at different times. And we need that mark, which is the shortest one, we bring up first, then followed by, by Matthew, about 15 years later, then Luke, and then John, sometime around 80, um, 90 or so. So the, the, the Gospel will come for written at different times. But remember, all four of them were eyewitnesses, and then all four of them would have had sources that would have been gathered information from and, and, and building up the whole narrative and giving us an overall perspective of what took place in relation to Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. That's why we need to read all the accounts. I indicated to you that because John was written last, you will notice that John deliberately leaves out some of the events that were covered in, 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 in a lot of detail in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and that's what you should notice when you read John. You see that John does not deal with some of the events that were mentioned by the, these others. But he also indicates some additional detail or, or, or give a, a conclusion to things that enlighten us a little more if he thinks that these crucial details would have been missing from the original account, or it could have been a, a misunderstanding that could have caused us to come away with the wrong interpretation. And John very much had to do that. This is really important to make sure we read John in relation to some events. And then also, it's important that we go back to the original, because what happens even with translators is that sometimes the tradition also gets stuck in their psyche and in, in, in their translation, they try to defend the tradition and sometimes omit keywords in the original Greek manuscript that would give some light on it. And so we have to make sure that we get sometimes the original manuscript to be clear in our minds what we are dealing with. And then we get some details from John. We see sometimes that the translators, some many of the other translations that we have, miss some of those details that creates something important. I think that true. That's that's a word assignment as well. And we will analyze that, and that will take a little time for us to go through. So we will not try to, to complete that tonight. But that is what one of the areas I want you to examine in terms. Of a discrepancy because there the, the are commentators that say if there are only two, then the critics who argue that there are discrepancies and contradictions could be right. But if there are more, in actual fact, if there are four, then a lot of these discrepancies are completely erased because all the details given, even by the different writers, will all build a complete narrative, which will give us essentially what the truth is. And that's what we will examine and see if you can come to that conclusion, or if you are still convinced that what we have been traditionally going by is what is accurate. Okay, we we'll think that true. Now I indicated to you that I wanted you to do some research on your own, and I will give you a chance um, to indicate to me, if you have seen any apparent discrepancies or contradictions in the narratives from the four accounts in relation to the crucifixion, I threw one in at the end of our session just so that you could have researched that one if you as yet had not discovered any because I waited for a while for you to give me some last week. It seems like you, know, you were not too sure uh, what you would consider as a discrepancy or maybe you would not have done enough research. So I said tonight we want to look at the inscription on the cross because that is one of the areas where we see that there are variances in terms of the account. And we want to try to reconcile this 
and see what conclusion we can come to. Because the reality is, when we read before Gospels, we see a different inscription. Is it different or is it part of one inscription? And is there only one inscription on the cross? Or uh, uh, the headboard, we should say, by the cross. Let me ask that question to you first before I go into any dialogue. Is there only one inscription that was placed above Jesus' head? Do you have any information from what you have read that there might not have been just one statement written above the head of Jesus on the cross? All right, while you were thinking about it, let's look at the, the, the four passages that mentioned in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Matthew 27, 37 says, And they set up over his head his accusation written. That's Matthew 27, 37. And they set up over his head his accusation written. Mark 15, 26. And Mark and, and, and Matthew very often have similar details. Mark says, and the superscription of his accusation was written over. That's, that's what um, Mark will say. And I want you to understand that what the Romans used to do is they would put what you were accused of or what you were found guilty of on the headboard, on, uh, on the cross above your head so that people would, would know where you are being crucified. So this is the importance of the, of the phrase here, his accusation. So for Jesus, it would have been being placed there what his accusation was. Luke 23, 38, and the superscription also is written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. And John says, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Now, so you're going to see then that even though you have different versions, everybody may not be reading from the King James Version, they got the NIV, the New International Version, etc. You will realize that not all the statements are the same. Now, I want you to tell me if you think there is a contradiction, there is a discrepancy, or that. We have a reason, a rationale for what we see, and it can be reconciled. I want you also to be telling me if you see any phrase that come out in all the, the, the inscriptions that is common to all. Matthew 27, 37, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark 15, 26, the King of the Jews. Luke 23, 38, this is the King of the Jews. And John 19, 19, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You see anything coming out that is common, first of all, to all of the inscriptions given by each of the gospel writers. That's why when, when, you, when you're doing research, I want you to write, write some notes that you have things at your fingertips. But I just read them for you. Have you heard anything that is common in all 40 statements? King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. 
is common to all four. So that's one thing you have. And, and what that really is, that is the accusation that is being placed there for why Jesus is being crucified. Now, that is what the Romans, that is what the Romans are placing there. For the Jews, Jesus was actually accused of blasphemy. That was what was important to them. If you read the scriptures carefully, they were accusing Jesus of claiming to be God. And that was blasphemy. And that's the reason why they would want to, to crucify Jesus because he is guilty of blasphemy. That is not significant to the Romans. That is, that's the religious issue for the Jews. What the Romans were, were concerned about is what the other accusation that was brought by the Jews, again, to convince the Romans that Jesus was guilty of, 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 of something that was very atrocious in claiming to be the king. Because they say we have no king but Caesar. And here Jesus is saying that he is the king. So that would be a serious thing for the Romans. So that would what, what the accusation would be. And that is what is common. That is what is highlighted. Now, there's also something significant mentioned in John and also mentioned in Luke. Did anybody spot that? It's not the inscription itself, but it's a point that is mentioned in those two that is significant. And I read it earlier up for you. The Jews wanted something inserted. Pardon me? The Jews wanted something inserted. The Jews yes, the Jews, oh, okay. The Jews wanted Pilate. This this comes from me, John. The Jews wanted Pilate to put something yeah. else in there. Yeah, he they said, said he's they said to him, I can read that for you. You're very good, uh, by the Lord. Um, the chief priest, I'm um, at John chapter 19, verse 21. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, he I said. am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. I have In other words, written. you deal with that. <laughs> you see? Because they didn't want the title to be that Jesus is the king of the Jews above his head. Yeah. So they want yeah. Pilate to say, he said that he was the yeah. king of the Jews. In other words, we don't accept him as any king. We have no <laughs> king but Caesar. So don't put that he is the king of the Jews. Write that he said he is the king of the Jews. Pilate said, no. What I have written, I have written. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is it. All right. But there's, there's another point that is significant because he asked the question Was there one statement on the cross? Why is it that we have these different statements? Yes, we have one thing in common to all of them the phrase, the king of the Jews. But that's all that Mark had. He's the shortest of them. Luke had the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. John had Jesus of Nazareth, the yeah. king of the Jews. And Mark and Matthew had, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. All right, you may not have spotted it, but this is it. The inscription on the cross, remember, we, we are interpreting and we have it in English as translated for us in English. But John and Luke told us that there was Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. The inscription was written in Greek, in Latin, and in Hebrew. And the longer form of the statement would have been, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That would have been the the, 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 the length of this full statement. And what has happened here is that each of those writers hold one of the different languages depending on the group that they were written, writing to and what they want to emphasize. Mm. Matthew written mostly to the Jewish audience. John would have been writing really at a time, as I said, the Romans Predominant, so he, he made a mere reference to the Latin and, and, and Luke with a mere reference to the Greek because remember Luke was writing to Theophilus who was a Greek 
um, person. I remember in the book of Acts and in the book of Luke, that is the person to whom Luke would have written. So Luke would have focused more now on the Greek element of it. So different writers just to put out a different part of the statement that they wanted to emphasize based on the audience they are writing to and what would have been more relevant. I remember these are the three languages that would have been prevalent at the time. The Roman it would have been the standard one that was, was prevalent. Yeah. Um, because remember, Rome would have conquered um, the, the Jews. The Greek was the sort of the cultural language, which would have been familiar to, to, to all of them. And the Hebrew would have been more related um, to the Jewish audience. So each writer, based on his emphasis, that's why he said you can have the same event, it's the same event. But different writers are pulling out a different aspect because of the, the person they are addressing and what they want to emphasize. So, so we can conclude really, there is no discrepancy, there, there is no contradiction because we have the acquisition that is common, the key of the Jews. All four of them have, have that. But again, the inscriptions, remember, the writing at that time, as I indicated before, they don't have punctuation. They don't have breaking in, in phrases and sentences. They don't have commas on full stop. It was just one set of lettering. According to the language is written, you have 26 letters, and another you have 19 letters, and another you probably have 16 letters. So the lettering is going to be different. And according to how the, the writers are, are writing and, and what they want to emphasize and the group to which they might be addressing, they just chose part of the overall statement, which, as I said, the complete form could have been, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So John had the greater part. He had Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But look how this is. He makes off Jesus of Nazareth. Because that may not have been significant to him, the king of the Jews. Mark missed this is Jesus of Nazareth, and he just put the king of the Jews. And Matthew said, This is Jesus. He missed of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So it's just that different writers omitted part of the statement that was on the cross because you had three different languages. It was not an English inscription written above the cross. There were three different languages, and each of the writers chose. Um, a different aspect of it. All right, I pause there for if there are any comments or queries or um, suggestions or perhaps a different viewpoint, um, you can do that. And then I want you now to go on to identify some of the other things that appear to be discrepancies. If you read the accounts, you should have, I saw about eight to 10 things were mentioned differently in all four of the Gospels, but they are not discrepancies. They are just what the writer chooses to emphasize or what particular perspective he may have had on a particular issue that he chose, he chose to highlight. And we will see that when we go through them. So I pause for any questions or any um, interjections. And, and meanwhile, if you have come across any other things that appear to be different in terms of the reporting from the Gospels, you bring that to my attention. I don't want to have to identify all of them. I want you to, you know, be your own input and to make sure that you are, you are studying and that you are seeing things. That would make me feel very good that you are, you know, getting into the whole habit of being meticulous and looking for details. So speak to me. Um, a question. Yes. Did Pilate write all three? One in, in Hebrew, one in Greek. And did, did, did Pilate write all three of them? No, because if, if you if you look if you look at the um the inscription as given by different reports, you will see that they, they came up with something that was slightly different, all right? For example,
and they set and they Matthew Matthew 27 37 says and they set up over his head over his head his accusation and they so you 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 you're, you're looking at more than one person here and a superscription also was written over him in, in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. So there could have been different inscriptions written by different people who might be um, more fluent in the language. So it might have been written in Greek by somebody different. It might have been written in Hebrew by somebody different. And it could have been written in Latin, which would have been the Roman established language by Pilot, who would have been a Roman. Yeah. But but then but then there were it, it, all three have been placed then on the board. So in other words, Pilot may not have written all three, but all three would have been inscribed on a piece of board. I don't know the size of it, but it would have been long enough to, to cover the, the, the three different forms of the language. And and they were placed, and the soldiers then would have nailed the inscription above um, Jesus' head. So but but Pilot would have told them what to write. Pilot might have told them what to write. Pilot might have told them what to write. And yeah. as I said, you could get different individuals who are more versed in the language, in the Hebrew and in the Greek and in the Latin. Right. But of, of course, Pilot would be versed in Latin because that would be his natural language. Roman, yeah, yeah, right. Right. Greek was the cultural language and Hebrew was more of the Jews. So a, a, a high priest could have written the Hebrew, some words could be written, but we, we don't know for sure. But what it says here, that verse 97, and Pilate wrote a title. See that? Verse John chapter 19, verse 19 says, yeah. and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was high to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek. And Latin. Right. And it, right. So so Pilate, yes, could have given the instruction to write. He could have yeah. written one one of phrase as it said here. Okay. But again, th those are different things that could have happened. But the, the writers do not go into detail as to who was responsible for each inscription. It just says that that an inscription was placed there, they placed it there. John is a little more specific. Remember, very often John gets to be very specific about things that might have been missed by the others because Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not specify anything. Matthew said they set up over his head. Mark said and the superscription was written. And Luke says and a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. But John said Pilate wrote a title. See, so John is a little more specific that that yeah. pilot actually did write something. Yeah. Now, as you rightfully say, he could have instructed all four statements in different languages. And you know that the accusation is common to all the king yeah. of the Jews. That is the yeah. accusation. Right? Yeah. He is up here on this cross because he claims to be the king of the Jews, not because he has been guilty of blasphemy. That's a Jewish issue. The Romans, the issue with Jesus here is that he is the king of the Jews. Remember what Jesus asked, well, asked Jesus, are you the king? Jesus said, well, you, you have said it. Yeah. See, so that is the accusation here for the Romans. The Jews were more about me. Right. So my conclusion here, I don't know if you disagree with me, is that, uh, that the full statement would have been, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But, yeah. but, John just mentioned Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Mark, this is the king of the Jews. Sorry, Luke, this is the king of the Jews. Mark, just the king of the Jews. And Matthew, just, this is Jesus, missile of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But it is obvious that of Nazareth had to be in there because John specifically said that Pilate wrote that inscription. So of Nazareth but had to be there, even though John was the only one that mentioned it. <clears throat> And the other just chose to highlight the part that they wanted to highlight, addressing to their particular audience, or just what they would have chosen to record 
at the point in time. As I said, you listen to reporting, different reporters can relate the same event and have slightly different details, but it does not mean <laughs> that it, it's, it's um, a discrepancy or that's a contradiction. Just it might have been a chosen omission on their part. Mm. So that is, is my conclusion um, of it. If you have a different yeah. conclusion, you know, I want you to feel free to say that to me. It sounds all right to me. <laughs> all right, so, so give me some more now. Give me some more. I want us to get as many as we can. I believe um, we had a raise hand out of a question or query from Ms. Sandra Potter Bostic. The church wishes to address us now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Oh. Hi. But I think that was more around the record. So if you prefer, I can hold them. Up. I, I, didn't, I didn't get you clearly. Uh, but it was more pertaining to the resurrection than the... In, oh, 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 you're, you're, you're wrong. It's more week. pertaining to the resurrection. Or you yeah. can hold that. You can hold that. So yeah. you're on, on well, cross-cutting. Yes. Because we're going to have one session just... Hop around. One. No problem. Right. Yeah, we will get there. We're just looking at the crucifixion. All right, let me throw one. How many statements did Jesus make in his final words? Is the fact that we get different writers saying different things a problem, a contradiction, a discrepancy, or again, is it just they chose to highlight a different aspect of what Jesus says in the final statements. Does anybody see any differences in the statements he made? Jesus' last words? All right, Matthew 15, again, 34 to 37. Matthew 27, 46 to 50. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani. Which is interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Luke 23, 46 says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. John 19.30, Jesus says, it is finished. Are, are, are we contradicting here? Do we have a discrepancy where each of the writers is given a different statement made by Jesus? Or can we conclude Jesus made all three of those statements at different times while he was on the cross? And what do you think was the last statement Jesus made before he died? It is finished. You believe it is finished? Gave, and he gave up the ghost. All right, by the spooner, and 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 the, and the your your statement, and he gave up the ghost comes immediately after it is finished. Is your is your quotation? <laughs> what, what is your quotation? No, no, no. I am I'm saying that um the last word he spoke was it is finished. Right. Didn't say I was asking you if. I, I, I was, uh, what's critical? I was asking you if 
when he said it is finished, did the same text that you read that said, he said it is finished, said that he gave up the ghost after he made that statement. That's what he was asking you. My, my, right, uh, that's my John, brother. that's John 19. That's, that's John 1930. Let's my look at that. Yes. That he bowed his head and uh -huh. gave up his spirit. If that he bowed his finished. head. He, it is right. finished. He, uh, with that, he bow his head and give up his spirit. Right. That's the NIV. Right. That's the NIV. Yeah. All right. And and uh, the King James said, and he gave up his voice. Gave yes. up the voice. Yeah. Right. So so for you, then those are the final words. Final words, yes. Right. Because he can't he can't die and then come back and speak again. Precisely. Precisely. <laughs> all, all right. <laughs> I say, I just want to see if you are you are going logically, right? That when you make a statement, <laughs> yeah, because there's some people, some people didn't believe that when he said it is finished, that that's, that that was the last statement. Some people believe that the last statement was into thy hands I commit my spirit. That when he said it is finished, he just was saying that his work was completed, and he bowed his head. While he was making that statement, he was just saying that the work has been completed. The assigned task has been completed. See, that's what some um, other people will say. And that they will conclude that the last statement was, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Now, Spooner, you have a very important point here. So we're going to look for the, the statement where Jesus made that. In today's hands, I commit my spirit. That's Luke 23, 46. And see what happened after that. Luke 23. See, this is what we call studying and going to the details. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, in today's hands, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, watch this carefully, he gave up the ghost. See why you see why he asked that question, Spooner? Because when we look at Luke, we see the same thing. So, which is the last? Was it immediately after? Now it said, having thus said, he gave up the ghost. John said he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. There is a time frame in between there when he could have said, In the day hands I commit my spirit, it is finished, and died. Or he could have said, It is finished, the work is complete. He gave up the ghost. And if you want to look at the first one, Matthew 15. Matthew 27, 46 to 50. And about the ninth hour, that's three o'clock, Jesus prayed with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elijah. So that statement we know was not the last statement because there is no follow-up there saying that he gave up the ghost after that. So we knew then that Jesus spoke after that. Those were not the last words. Now, so can we conclude that? Is it reasonable to conclude that that Matthew account does not tell us that those were the last words. Remember Mark and Matthew again, similar on that. So we, we now have to dis, dis study them between Luke and John. So we are concluding, first of all, that there's no discrepancy. Jesus spoke more than once on the cross and different writers are recording statements that he made. We have two comparative from Matthew and Luke. It's just the spelling of, of Eloi, Eloi is different. 
Mark has an Eli, Eli, and sorry, Eloi. Ma Matthew has an Eli, Eli. Okay, that's just the difference there, but it's, it's, it's basically the same statement. But we're just written in a, in a different um, language. But Luke and John have two different statements which occur at the end. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and it is finished. So are we agreed then that there's no contradiction in these statements? It's just different writers giving different statements. All we have now to work out is which was the last one because both of them said, now what John said, he bowed his head. So he could have said he bowed, he could, he could, he could have said technically it is finished, meaning that the work is completed. His mission is completed. And then the very final word could have been Father into thy hands I commend my spirit and he died it could have been either one because both of them ended up by saying but that's why he made the point that, that some are more willing to conclude that into thy hands I commend my spirit is the last one we would be more inclined to think that the words it is finished the last words, but you see, what he meant was that his task was finished and he's now committing himself into the hands of the Almighty who will usher him into paradise. But that is nothing that we need to beat ourselves over. What we, what we are concluding is that there's no discrepancy because we have different words. They are all statements made by Jesus. Same event, but different reporters giving a different statement. All right, so we have the last words. We have Reverend Chapman? Yes, the inscription. Yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, looking mm -hmm. touch back on Okay, back at Matthew and Mark. Um, Mark 27, verse 50, suggested Matthew. that... Matthew 27, verse 50. Matthew 27, yes. Matthew 27. Yes, down to 50. Jesus, when he had cried again, watch it. See that? Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he let the voice. So what you saw earlier in Matthew is when he made one statement, but that was not the last utterance. See? So that's what you're curious about. I was so I was actually commenting on the fact that yes, it matches back with what. Luke said in verse 46, um, I said that because if Luke for um, in verse 46 of Luke, he said he cried with a loud voice and then said, Into my hands I commend my spirit. Yes, so, yes, right, that's that's parallel, that's correct, it matches back with that, right? And then the same thing with, with um, Mark 15, verse 37, which would match back with Mark, Mark 15, right. which is why some people would be inclined to conclude. That, that was the final statement because you, you 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 have it here being indicated to you in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke, so that the, the it is finished and bowed his head may not have been the final thing, but the last utterance could have been into the hands I commend my spirit, simply because you you got more harmony. In the others. So the final words, yes, would have been those. My, Early up in Matthew, 
that statement was not the final statement. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Was the earliest statement. And Matthew indicated that he prayed again with a loud voice and, and he let the ghost. So what we're just saying is that it, when saying that, he would have said that in that loud voice. Yes. Okay. He said that in that low voice. In other words, that perhaps would be the, lo the last low expression. Uh, and, the bow, and, the bow, and the bow in his head might have been a, 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 a milder statement. In, in other words, Jesus is, is, is confirming this. This is completed. My work has been completed. He uttered that before he died. But as I said, you know, that is not a, a, a matter that, that we, we need to wrestle with. The inclination could have been, because I said different interpreters have a difference as to the final word. People are more inclined to go with it is finished because it, it sounds like the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. But he, he may not have meant that meant in that sense. He just meant in, in Spanish meaning the work is completing. Hello? I don't know. When was Jesus crucified? When? The time in. I, I mentioned that earlier. That's another one that appears in the discrepancy. See? Because Mark 15, 25 says, Jesus was crucified on the third hour. That's what Mark says. The third hour in Jewish time would be 9 a.m. If we want to use a.m. But remember, the Jews didn't use that. The Jews used first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour, et cetera, et cetera. We, we just trying to connect it to the, to the Roman Gregorian sort of time. So we would say 9 a.m. But it says the third hour. Matthew 27, 45, and Luke 23, 44, have him on the cross before the sixth hour, which is noon. But John 19, 19, sorry, 14 to 15, gives us the indication that in the sixth hour, Jesus was still dealing with his trial before Pilate. So the question here is, that you got a discrepancy. Because one of your gospels saying he is crucified on the third hour, and another one is saying that at the sixth hour he is still before Pilate dealing with trial. So, what are we dealing with here? Now, if you if you if you're going to use just Jewish time, there will be a discrepancy. Because the third hour is nine o'clock, he said, and the sixth hour will be twelve noon. So how it could be that you crucify him at nine o'clock, but yet another writer is saying at twelve o'clock noon he was still on trial. You see that discrepancy is solved. Then you realize that John. Remember, I, I told you already, John very much connected to using the Roman um, time and, and things very much connected to, to the Romans. And so when John used the sixth hour, he was using the sixth hour in terms of the Roman time. So it should be like six o'clock in the morning. And that would be correct because Jesus was in trial even up to the morning time. And so it would not be a discrepancy if he was on trial at 6 o'clock in the morning. That's what the 6 hour means, 6 a.m. Because John is here using like the Roman time signal where the day would have changed at 12 o'clock midnight. He's using the Roman Gregorian system here and not the Jewish time. If he was using Jewish time, but then that would arguably be a discrepancy because you can't have Jesus crucified at 3 o'clock. And another way to say at 12 o'clock, he is still before Pilate. He's probably dealing with different days. So he was talking about early in the morning that Jesus would be still on trial. 
and it's not the six hour meaning Jewish time that will carry you to 12 o'clock because then that will be discrepancy that Jesus is crucified at three according to Mark at nine sorry at nine and then John is saying that he's still before so the reality is Jesus was crucified early and as I said, the, the, the tradition that we established Jesus being on the cross from 12 to 3, that's not the actual time that he was on the cross. He was on the cross, he was crucified, according to Mark, from 9 o'clock. That 12 to 3 is when the Bible indicates that darkness came on the earth. 12 to 3. That is very, very significant. I think I indicated historically there are writings to prove that that actually happened. Then Matthew talks about a great earthquake. Um, and darkness is covering the earth, and that is recorded. Now, there's some people who want to argue, the scientists will argue, oh, that is not anything miraculous. That is not anything directly initiated by God Almighty. All that was, was an eclipse of the sun that those people saw. So this thing about that darkness came on the earth, from 9 to 3, as something, from 12 to 3, sorry, as something significant that God had initiated. And, and let me tell you, even if, if God won't initiate that, physically speaking, he could. But the reality is that it, it was a miracle performed by the Almighty. Because when you go to the saints, remember I told that Jesus was crucified around a full moon. And you and, and, and Dilma asked on me, you are not going to get a total eclipse of the sun out of the moon. It doesn't happen in that way. The astronomers will tell you that. You don't get a total eclipse of the sun out of the moon. And then secondly, darkness covered the earth from nine, sorry, from 12 to three. That's three hours. We have seen eclipses of the sun. There's no eclipse of the sun that usually goes for three hours. It's usually much briefer than that. So on lines of scientific argument, if we want to use that, those are things that we could say. So the 12 to 3 that we were celebrating is not that Jesus was crucified at 12 and died at 3. He was on the cross earlier. That's the time of darkness. So to, to deal with that this apparent discrepancy, what the Bible commentators have recognized is that John was using the Roman time and not the Jewish time. John was, Mark, sorry, was using the Jewish time. So that will clarify that. So there's no discrepancy. But what John will be saying is that early in the morning, Jesus was still on trial. In between there, you know, moving backward and forward and a whole lot of things happening. Um, Jesus being mocked and flogged and and all of those things, and then you have to travel with the cross, right? Because some people were saying well, you have a three-hour gap between six in the morning and then nine a.m. Yes, but a lot happened inside there because a whole lot of things were happening to Jesus. Uh, Reverend, Pam, we seem to have a yes. theory or comment from Pastor Weeks. Went up, Brother Weeks. Yes, Brother Weeks. Yes, please. Good night. Good night. Good night to you. Yes, please. Now, one of the things about that we have to understand about the Gospels, for sure, that you said already, is that the audiences yes. are different. Audiences are different, yes. And you, you only write what your audience need to know. Right? right? And the truth is, if you have four Gospels, and each of them said the same thing, the same full stop, the same comma. That would be a problem. More than a problem. Yes. I, we would tend to believe that it's not credible. Yeah. They, they, right. People argue that, they, they argue that it's collusion. Correct. 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 Yes. So what happened is that we have to understand why Luke wrote how he wrote. And Luke yes. is written to, to, to Theophilus to give him correct. a hard account of what was believed among the brethren. And, yes. and, and we have to understand each book. That's why Matthew now will use a lot of or Testament scriptures say it was fulfilled, it was fulfilled, it was fulfilled because he was running to the Jews. Correct. 
And those things were 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 important for you Jews to understand. So you will see he quoted a lot of what is the scriptures to prove to the Jews that Christ is really the, the Messiah and the one that is to come. You don't Correct. see that whole lot in other places. And you Correct. see and you see John bringing out other things, John bring out the deity of the Holy Spirit, calling him a person. Um, the woman that was caught in adultery, you don't see that in other places. You bring out also that he was the word that became flesh. So again, the audience determine what you're right. For instance, if you wrote to a Beijing, a Beijing will understand what it means that Pastor Jackman is not a sweet bread. Yeah. The average person cannot understand that if you're American. So you know your audience and you're right to suit. But I think if you understand those, it would be better. And I think to what makes it very credible is that even though you have different writers, that's why normally when I teach on any subject that has um the same the same events i pull them together and when you pull them together you find that somebody may say something that other person didn't say and then you end up with a with a full package then at the end of it when you are doing as you are doing right now and quoting all the different sources and then bringing them together then to see um the areas that somebody didn't say the ones that people pretend so you're, it's almost like at the end of the day you get the whole the whole story that's correct very right. much so. Yeah. That, very much so. And, and those are two significant points that you, you mentioned. And the credibility of the Bible is enhanced by the differences, which shows that they're independent accounts and not people plagiarizing or copying or trying to repeat what somebody say or colluding and say, well, let me put them these stories to convince people. So, so what people will be viewing as a negative, in fact, really is a positive because it, it, it shows that, that there was, they were independent in their writings and they were very specific in details they were given in relation to the people who were writing. So that's why he said earlier that there are things that John didn't even mentioned at all. You know that John had discussed Jesus' birth. John John had go into the lineages of, of Jesus. But that's Matthew true. gone into that and looked because Jews are interested in lineages, who descended from where and, and, and that. But John didn't deal with that. Um, and furthermore, they said, if John being the last writer, was convinced that those people give enough details on a point. He wanted to just rehash the same thing. He goes on to expand or to give more light or add details that might complete the narrative if he figures that there might be details that they might be missing. So it's it's a beautiful way in which even though they wrote years apart, they may sit down together and write this in the same time period. You know, they wrote at different times they indicated. Yes. And yet the harmony that you have, and even with the differences, they are not discrepancies. They are not contradiction. It is just from a different perspective. And that's why I'm just trying to show you from the word how credible the Bible is and what appears and what critics want to use to try to discredit the uh, resurrection and the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, when it comes to resurrection, we'll see even more how they try to, to discredit things by trying to claim inaccuracies. No, they're not. They're just different times and remember that then there are study gospels the, the three critical things you have to look at the event the place and the time those are critical the details of the event the place of the event and the time because if we get those right we can see that they're not discrepancies if we get them wrong and mix them up then it would appear to be discrepancies so we must be clear and that's why i'm trying to be very meticulous and very detailed to show you the time of things and that's where we come to look at this whole thing with the thieves on the cross that is a, that is a little bit an interesting one that's why i mentioned it to throw out there you can do some reading on it but there are some details that we have to examine that will open your eyes to things that you may not have seen i don't know if anybody will want to express um what their opinion is before um we, we, we close now then there's another discrepancy by the means you're finished y yes please pastor i'm good Right, the net discrepancy. So we have then Jesus was crucified, we've clarified that. He really was crucified at, 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 at um, 9 a.m. And John is just using a Roman time and not a Jewish time that people will say, that, ha, Mark says he crucified at, at, at 3, and John saying he's still talking to Pilate at 6, at 12. No, that's 6. That 6 hour is the 6 hour in Roman time, which is 6 o'clock in the morning. And Jesus was still on trial and dealing with those things early in the morning. We clarify the last words and we 
also look at the inscription. And then there is something that people question. What did Jesus really drink? Did he drink wine and vinegar? Matthew 15, 23. Jesus is given wine mixed with myrrh, but he doesn't drink. Watch that carefully. Mark 15, 36 says vinegar and sour wine. Matthew 27, 48. And Luke 23, 36 says Jesus is given vinegar, but he doesn't drink. John 19, or John again, 29 to 30 says Jesus is given vinegar and he drinks. So are we dealing with the same time here? Remember what I said earlier? Details, right? The event, the place, and the time. Now we got the place and the event locked down here. Jesus is, is, is being crucified on Golgotha. And you will notice that some accounts say Golgotha and one account said Calvary. Again, is that a discrepancy? No. Golgotha was a term which is a Hebrew or Arabic term which means the place of the skull. Of the skull. Calvary is more a Latin inscription coming from the Latin word Calvara which means a skull. So technically, you got different words there. It's the same place. There's no discrepancy, just a different term used because you're using a different language. Remember that in the text, very often you're going to see Hebrew coming out another time or Aramaic. Sometimes you're going to see Latin coming out another time you're going to see Greek coming out. But uh, you've got to bear that in mind so that you understand that there's really no discrepancy. Now here, you see wine mixed with myrrh. Now, Jesus is on the cross for a length of time. Folks, remember that he was crucified at three. I sorry, at nine a.m. He died at three. That's a lot of time in there. Now, at the beginning of the event, they gave Jesus wine mixed with myrrh. So, so, so Mark is relating what happened at the beginning of the event. If you read it carefully, why they're doing that? Wine mixed with myrrh is a painkiller. The Romans often, in, in a little mercy, will give the, the persons who are being crucified something to help ease the pain. Listen, it's a painful experience being on a cross. As I explained to you, the reason why they broke the leg, crucifixion could go on for days, folks. You could be on a cross for two days, suffocating, until the blood gets into your lungs and you actually drown in your own fluids. That's why they stretched out the arms, they were hanging down and it was crushing the lungs and they would be, be suffocating. So what the, the persons would do is to push up on their feet to be able to breathe properly. So because the Sabbath was joined out and according to the law, you cannot have people on a cross on the Sabbath. You've got to get them down. That's the reason why they broke their feet so that they will not be able to push up and, and, and make breathing easier. What will happen is if their feet broken, they will be hanging down and they will be pulling on the, on, the, on, the, on the lung and they will suffocate quicker and die. That's the reason for it. Jesus refused to take the myrrh and the wine. Jesus wants to bear the pain and the suffering and the agony for us, folks. You, 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 you have to understand what Jesus is enduring for us. And that's why we have to take the sacrifice of the cross seriously. Because Jesus endured the full burden of the pain. He did not even take the myrrh and the wine to ease the pain. He refused to drink. Mark says vinegar and, 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 and sour wine. Um, no, myrrh is something bitter. Vinegar is something bitter. But again, he's being offered things at different times on the cross. 
So it isn't it, it isn't that they're mixing up the reporting. It is that he's given different things, and the accounts will be given different according to the time. You will see that they dip it in his salt and they put it on a reed. Dip it in, in myrrh and put it on a reed. The reed here could, could be referring to a, a sort of a bush that you'd be using. But then John indicates that Jesus is given the vinegar and he drinks it. This is coming on um, to, the, to, the, to the ending. Because he said, I thirst. So we are dealing with things given to Jesus at different points and the different reasons that they indicated for what we're, we're giving him. And again, that is not a discrepancy. It is just that different details are being recorded by different um, authors here based on different things happening in that interim from that nine o'clock to the three o'clock when, when Jesus died. Oh, Another thing that people put, yeah, somebody was making a, a statement. Yeah, just a comment on that one there. Um, yes. So I'm seeing that he would have been given, you said wine with gall. Is a correct yes. Wine with gall, right. which, which means it's something bitter. Um, uh, I'm get, getting the idea that it's also something that can be poisonous. So it's alleged then that. Um, yes, it could have been a sort of easy pain, but it could have also been something to quicken his death. So that's another reason. It, it, yeah, it, could, it, could, it, it could, yes, it could be poisonous. I rem and remember, things are poisonous too, also based on the amount that you use. Correct. Right, because we, we got poisonous cassava that we would use, but you mean you, you might eat a little piece of poisonous cassava, you don't die because it is not the amount. So, yes, gall, gall can be used as a poison. And and what you could be saying is that in, in their mercy, yeah, they could be trying to hasten his death. And, and Jesus refused to um, take, take it because Jesus knows his purpose. Jesus knows what he has to suffer. Right. So there's that. But, but as I said, yeah, but as I said, it, it could also be a means of, of easing the pain. So mm -hmm. it, may not be, right, it may not be the amount in it that will, will kill him instantly, but it will have to ease a lot of the pain. But as the Bible said, you just refuse to drink. I, um, yeah, so that, that's a good point you mentioned there again. Different word used. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, uh, that would have been before, I mean, he was first put on the cross. But then um, Matthew, John, and I do believe Mark as well. Yes. That's that close to, close to his... Um, Finally, given the ghost, he would have been given just a sponge of vinegar. To, yes, and that he drank. And that he drank. That's right. That he drank. Right. So, so right. We're dealing with different times here. Just remember that, which mm -hmm. is the, which is the important point here. Mm -hmm. you always have to look at the event, place, and time, and try to reconcile things. If you get the times right, it could solve a lot of problems. So, isn't that he would offer these things at the same time? And that the writers are mixing them up. He were offered different things at different times. He refused to drink on one occasion, and another occasion he, he drank. So that would clear that discrepancy. And then what this just one other one here, um, with the statements then made by the centurion. Right, the Romans witnesses witnessed Jesus' crucifixion, but what did they think according to what we have in the writings? Mark 15 9 says, A centurion is cited as saying, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Mark 27 54 said, Truly, this was the Son of God. He used man, this was the Son of God. Luke 23 47 said, Truly, this man was innocent. And in John, he does not record any of the centurion saying anything. Maybe he didn't think, as I said, it was a need to say it because Mark mentioned it, Matthew mentioned it, and Luke mentioned it. Right? The synoptic gospels. Again, different words, 
But all happens here is that a different writer is just picking statements that will be made. There was not one statement made. There were Roman centurions there. There were Roman soldiers there. And you could have heard a statement which says, this man was the son of God. And you could have also heard a statement that says, truly, this man was innocent. Not a discrepancy. Just different words being expressed. Just like Jesus on the cross used different statements to express his feelings at the point in time. And this is all that is here. That is not a major discrepancy. See, again, these, these are minor ones. The biggest one that we're going to have to look at is the thieves or the robbers, as mentioned, or the criminals. And I say here to you, why it's important you look at the Greek because the Greek uses two different words. So the conclusion is that there's a different word for robber or thief and a different word for criminal, which means that they could be two different groups. It is true that a robber is a criminal, but all criminals may not be necessarily robbers. And when Greek use a different word, folks, it's a for purpose and I take it seriously. And the Greeks are very, very good at that linguistically. When we use love, we say love. The Greeks got agape, they got eros, they got philia, they got storge. So you can see when they are speaking of love, when they mean God's love, love between a man and a woman, love between um, friends, or love between relatives. Greek has a different word. And when Greeks use different words, Really, we must pay attention to those words and the possibility that it can mean something different. Okay? But we will not go through that tonight. That is going to be hell for next week because it's going to take us some time to break it down and to analyze all the accounts. And you will notice things that are coming to them and things that are different. And yes, each of them will mention one on each side. One on each side. But could one on each side mean a robber on each side? And also another person who is described as a malefactor or a criminal on the other side. So you have two and two. A criminal and a robber or thief. A criminal and a robber and Jesus in the center. What we will have to look at is when they're breaking their feet, the pattern that they take. Also, when were the people put on the cross? Were they all put there at the same time? All of those are important nuances that we will look at from the word and see if you can conclude that there's a possibility that indeed John clarified it when he had the origin in the Greek and a word that appeared before the Greek indicates that there could have been two on either side of Jesus. We will examine that coming in the next session. Don't miss it. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Yes. Yeah, before we close I, off, um, I see that um, Sandra had one other query for you. Um, yes. She mentioned that only Matthew mentioned the earthquake and the holy dead men coming out of the tombs. And she wanted her take on that. Correct. All right. No, we, we, are, we are going to dialogue about that. Because that is one, we leave that for the next session. Um, that is one of the comments that credits make. And they make sport and say, well, well how, how could these other writers miss the zombie apocalypse? That's what they refer to. You're going to tell me that an event such as people coming up from the grave and appearing to people in Jerusalem and being witnessed with others could only be recorded by Matthew and they mentioned by the other writers. Could, could that be an event that actually take place? And there's some people who say it might be just a spiritual um, signal as to what will happen in the end time where Jesus will come and he will raise us all up from the dead. That's what they're saying. Now, is it just a spiritual 
application here, or is it a physical event? That's what we will discuss. Sandra, you're right. Matthew is the only one that mentions that earthquake and that people um, coming up from the grave. Remember, we said that the earthquake was actually a physical event that took place and it's recorded historically. And there's a strong belief that the resurrection was a physical e event. The question is, where did those people go? Now, have people been resurrected from the dead before? Yes, Lazarus was. And he remained on the earth till he died again. Eutychus was. Rid of Nain's son was. There are people in the Bible who have been resurrected from the grave and lived. Now, what the big question here is, is how many people where these were, and how come that this is not an event that would have been so significant that is mentioned by the others? Could it be that this is all a hoax and this is not a reality? So don't miss the next section. We will look at that in a little more detail. Sandra, that's a good um, observation. And we will stop at this point because it's nine o'clock and they said we don't want to go past so all the questions and and read, read, read the four accounts on the thieves on the cross. Or I should say the, the persons on the cross. Are they two different groups? Or are they just two thieves? Et cetera, et cetera. We will analyze that in the next session in very good detail so you get a good understanding. And then covering that, we will pick up on some of the apparent discrepancies from the resurrection account, because that has a number of interesting nuances in it as well. So thank you for being here tonight and taking part in the in the study. And I'm looking forward to be sharing with you next session coming. It's going to be exciting. So I want you to um, be here for. I know you will have your own opinions on the cross issue of who were there. We will look at it and examine it to see what really is the truth that we can gather. Thank you very much and God bless you.